Hello and a very warm welcome to the Late Breaking F1 podcast presented by Harry Eid, Sam Sage and me, Ben Hocking. It's another off-season episode, which probably means there's not much going on, Sam. There's there's not much going on. I'm going to hit you with that. yee Goodness me. Why are you high and Sam? Well, I'm going to let Ben fill you in on a few things. Yes, it's not a yee without reason because... As we have alluded to uh, very subtly a few times on this podcast before, we are going back to Austin in October for the United States Grand Prix, but that's not it. Because Thursday, 17th of October, 7 p.m., Peach Social House, Brentwood, North Austin. It's a late breaking live show. We're coming back. We're doing another live show. Uh, tickets are on sale now for our Patreon subscribers today, Wednesday, 7th of August. Um, you've got just over a week as we're recording this. If you are a Patreon subscriber on our middle or upper tier, um, before any remaining tickets go on general sale. So you've got until next Sunday, which is the 18th, um, and 6 p.m. British time on that day. So that works out to uh, 1 p.m. Eastern and 10 a.m. Pacific. You've got until then if you are a patreon subscriber or want to become a patreon subscriber to take advantage of that benefit um all the details of course will be in the description um and you can go ahead uh, and avoid disappointment because last year sam they went very quickly oh they sold out and we were so much smaller as a show back then and you get other little cool things like free parking a drink is included in your ticket free parking free (laughs) Free free parking parking. You can park your giant your horse. cars wherever you want. <laughs> Harry was really keen to get the free parking in, so I'm glad we've done yeah, that. Yeah, thank so one God. Thing he said, please shout out the free parking. There was a real debate about the free parking, whether it should be included. And, and do you know what? We made the right call. I'm so glad. <laughs> That's a goddamn right call. Free parking right now. Um, yeah, Producer no, Kirsty's yeah. got a head and hands. <laughs> crying. That's completely fair. Um, yeah, we'll run through a whole live show. We'll play some games. We'll have a chick chat. We we'll stick around as well all evening, talking to you lovely lot as well. It's a really, really fun time. We've done two now this will be number three (laughs) on the live show count and uh, they just get better every time so don't miss out come along i've been so excited for this that today i listened to our last last year's live show and i'm good i spent the last year practicing how to say austin so they got it right thank you love that if that's not a reason to come i don't know what is (laughs) it might not be right on the night i'll get nervous right on the night (laughs) So yes, we've been uh, we've been waiting a while to to finally make this uh, announcement. So thank you for bearing with us, and we would love to see uh, as many of you there as possible. Thursday, seventeenth of October. If you're a Patreon subscriber, middle or upper tier, you can get those tickets right away. Come back to this episode, obviously, but you can do so right away. Um, Kirsty is now either going to give me the thumbs up or the thumbs down in case I have forgotten anything to mention. Yeah, yes. yes. hey, boom, 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 boom. <laughs> Very American of you, Harry. Pew, pew, pew. <laughs> Good. Um, on with the show then. Um, we've got a show dedicated. Of course, it's the the summer break. Uh, it's a good time to reflect on what has already happened and what might still be to come in the F1 season. So we're going to look at all of the 10 teams and we're going to give a three-word summary each on how we think their season has gone to this point. And we'll give them a grade as well because, you know, we we like to do that. Um, We're going to go in championship order, uh, constructors' championship order. So we will start with Red Bull, who are leading the way, perhaps not quite as comfortably as they would expect or like, given how well they started this season. Um, we'll we'll kickstart with uh, our three-word summaries each, uh, and then we'll get into it. Sam, what's your three-word summary for Red Bull? I've gone for squeaky bum time. Oh, I like that. It is a bit, isn't it? summary, yep. Harry? I've gone for good at F1. <laughs> oh, nice. <laughs> you had to get that in there somewhere. Yeah, I fair. mean, have any one, it had to be them. I can't wait for whatever team you've decided to do. Uh, what are you doing? And then just put an apostrophe somewhere in it. What are you? What are you is yeah. one word, isn't it? Well, well, what are you? Uh, I have gone for dynasty under threat. Um, Sam, squeaky bum time. Why? Yeah, I've get, should I get my grade at this point as well, Ben? Uh, we'll do grade, we'll do grade at the end. Okay, grade at the end. Yeah. A little sandwich moment for you there. We're really bookmarking this. Um, right. 
Squeaky bum time. They have been so dominant over the last couple of years. And of course, they dethroned Mercedes in 2021 with the Drivers' Championship. And they wanted to be incredibly dominant last year with Verstappen won, what was it, 18 of the 23, 17 of the 23 across the whole season, breaking records left, right and centre. And it looked as though the start of this season was going to be very much kind of the, the same medicine that we we're all going to be spoon-fed for the next year. No, no, not to be, because the car has begun to crumble. Sergio Perez's form is nowhere to be found. It's like a Where's Wally book. Can you see it on this page? Who knows? Is it really there? But I found the dog. He's over there. No sign of Perez's form, though. Um, and then, of course, you've got... <laughs> you've got Roscoe um, in the corner, yeah. Yeah, good old Roscoe. Max Verstappen is c- carrying the entire team on his shoulders while people are quite literally jumping off at the nearest life raft they can find. It might be in the scope of Audi for Jonathan Wheatley. I've heard that Adrian Newey is, is secretly disguising his life raft, refuses to, for some reason, show who he's actually signing for. And Christian Horner is doing things that he probably shouldn't. So, yeah, it just feels like it is... Falling apart, they're having a bad time. It's really not going well for them. And I think the staff is doing a grand old job at scoring as many points as he can and keeping this championship alive because without him, they would be in the mud. So I think our, as in our, myself and Sam's three word summaries have certainly focused more on the the negative aspect uh, of Red Bull so far this year. But Harry, forever the optimist, good at F1. Um, like, I don't disagree with any of the points Sam has made uh, or, or you're about to make, I'm sure, Ben. Uh, but despite that, if we're going by the first half of the season, they still lead both championships. Max totally Verstappen and Le Perez is his own separate issue. And like I said, I don't disagree with what you're saying. But Red Bull, the Red, if Red Bull and if F1 was a one, uh, one driver per team sport, Red Bull and Max Verstappen would be like ultimate, ultimate team because apart from maybe Hungary, where they had a little falling out in the middle of the race, the strategy wasn't good, Max was mad. Apart from that, the rest of the year, they just even when they're not winning, they'd just be picking up good points every race. And they're just quite good at the F1. And like you said, Sam, the start of this year, it's easy to forget how quick they were at the start of this year, especially in the hands of Verstappen. Uh, there was a point, I think, at the start of the year where we were both, all, all three of us were like, oh, oh no, it's, it's 2023 again. China. China was probably again. that point, yeah. Especially when they did, you know, four pit stops in 7.8 seconds or something ridiculous. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, yes, they've had some more, they've had some challenges in the in the past few races, but as I said, they still lead. And as of the last race, Verstappen extended his world championship lead in the drivers' uh, championship. So, good at F1. I think summarizes how, how their year has gone so far. I will say it is ridiculously impressive how Verstappen has managed to extend his championship lead, even though he has, and this isn't dis- disrespect to him, no right to. Um, there have been so many instances where it's like, oh, that hasn't gone very well for Red Bull and Verstappen. Um, surely, no, hang on. It's bigger than it was before. Great. Um, what, was what was bigger? You don't want to know. <laughs> um <laughs> Dynasty under threat is what I've gone for. So, you know, I'm I'm joining Sam on the, the negative train. Um, it was an excellent start to the year. Four of the first five races, they had double podiums um, and, and one, uh, one of them was on the top step, of course. Um, but it has been much tougher since then. Everything about this team right now, at least to me, is just like at odds with their championship position. Like if you didn't watch any of the races and had no idea what was going on in the races, but you were keeping up with everything that happened off track, you would immediately assume this team is like midfield and plummeting based on everything else that's happened off track. Um, Yet despite that, as Harry mentioned, they are still very good at the F1 and they are getting by. Um, you know, they, they do have a lot going on. I, I do think 2024 in years to come might be seen as the start of the decline of this dynasty. Um, key personnel leaving, Christian Horner allegations, Perez's form. Um, they don't know what to do with their junior junior team. Um, Helmut Marko, Jos Verstappen, Christian Horner all seem at odds with one another. And I think a real concern for them is that, yes, Verstappen has been brilliant, but... I don't think they have ever been more reliant on Verstappen in their life. Like he is so integral to their success right now with everything else happening around him. So yeah, I there are question marks. I, I don't know. I do have one more question for both of you. I'll start with you, Sam. 
and this is very hypothetical, this is not going to happen. I give you £10,000. Oh, I really could do with that. But there's one condition. You can only spend it on a bet on who's going to win the Constructors' Championship. Who is your money going on at this point? McLaren. Harry? McLaren. Ben? Yeah, McLaren. We've got to be poor, boys. <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> Verstappen walk into the bookies like, <laughs> uh, when they win. Um, grade for them, Sam? I'll give them a B. Straight up, B. Harry? I've gone for an A. But I love that. Positive, so. Yeah, I'm with Sam. I've, I've gone for a B as well. I, I think on track, it, it's better, but I, I'm at least including some of the off-track stuff in this grade. I think it, it matters. Let's move on to McLaren. Again, let's go through three word summaries, Sam. Uh, I've borrowed from a famous phrase. I'm sure you can all finish off because I can't really use three words, but I've used future is now. And um, that's because their young driver line up is fantastic. I'll get into the details in a minute, but I'm sure you can work out with a meme that I'm referencing. Harry? I've put fast but silly. I like that. <laughs> I like that a lot. Um, my my three word is Miami momentum shift. Momentum. So, <clears throat> yes. Um, Sam, young driver lineup that you like. Yeah, I mean, the future is now, old man. And Lando Norris and Oscar Piastri have arrived on the scene. And whilst Norris is an absolute bottler when it comes to starts, he is still an absolute threat in every single Grand Prix he competes in. He believes that he's an absolute top-tier driver now, and we're starting to see what he's really made of. And Piastri is really kind of stepping into the, the ring. He's really announced himself. The car is absolutely spectacular. Stella and Zach Brown have brought, brought together a fantastic team that seems to really be able to harness a lot of the key skills, understand the characteristics of the car. They're delivering well on that Mercedes engine as well, because it's not theirs, of course. I just think that everything is swinging in the right direction for them. The only thing that is bringing their grade down for me at the moment is slow starts of the season, but they are recovering very, very nicely. And of course, as Harry's already referenced, the silliness that they went through in the likes of Hungary, which I do think they need to iron out pretty darn quick. Otherwise it might come back to bite them. But for me, this is, boy, it's looking pretty tasty. Uh, Harry, you've uh, you've managed to summarise McLaren season and my approach to sex. So, <laughs> no, no. <laughs> oh, I did not see. Well, I was about to say that. Did not see that coming. And well, I guess that also goes. That's also shame. appropriate. <laughs> <laughs> oh. oh boy gosh I might, might re-record that <laughs> I guess it was bigger than they said no, I would leave that in <laughs> definitely leave that in make that a patron only oh. okay Harry you've gone for fast but silly <laughs> <laughs> that has to stay in now because there's no context for the laughter <laughs> just do it again uh, I've gone for Fast for City, which, which, yes, um, <laughs> because they are very fast, McLaren, but they're silly, silly boys and girls because they've wasted opportunities this year. Um, hung, well, the, the hunger is not wasted because they obviously won, so that's different silliness. But things like uh, Silverstone spring to mind, they should have been a one-two of that one. Um, uh, Spa, I think they should have, they should have done better at Spa. Uh, so there are there are some opportunities that are not grasping, and it, hopefully the thirty grand that we've invested in them winning the betting <laughs> on them winning the, uh, the the constructors is not oh, wasted no. because they could still there's a real possibility that you know they could still not quite clinch it if they carry on with their silly antics and it all it takes is is for Sergio Perez to come walk back from the summer break refreshed rejuvenated. And in the with the confidence that he's not going to get sacked, I wouldn't be that confident, Sergio. But it might walk back from the summer break and and just be back on form, and it can make it a real headache for McLaren because when he's not been on form, I'm not sure they've actually grabbed all the points they should have done in in closing that gap down. So fast but silly. Uh, I've gone for Miami momentum shift, um, and, and I was I was thinking about this and. 
there were three things I think that were true. Well, two of them were definitely true, but the other one's a bit more of an opinion that were true heading into the Miami weekend. So Norris had no race wins going into that race weekend. Piastri had had a pretty bad start to the season. And Adrian Newey still had a contract at Red Bull. And I think in years, uh, not only for this season, but actually in years to come, Miami is going to be seen as something of a turning point because the most obvious of those three, Lando Norris took the race win. That was a massive moment for him, given how many close calls he'd had to that point. Um, And actually, even though we have questioned some of his executions since that point, he has routinely been him and Verstappen fighting first and second. He's been second or third in five of the eight races since Miami. So he has, it has helped him, I think, in terms of his confidence. The one that's not spoken about as much is how much of a turnaround it was for Oscar Piastri because he didn't, he didn't score points to that race. But in terms of like the pace that he displayed, it was such an improvement on what he had done I think, in the first part of the year. So if you were to look at his first five races of this season before Miami, he was eighth in Bahrain, but was outqualified by Norris and behind him in the Grand Prix. He was fourth in Saudi Arabia, which was fairly solid. He was fourth in Australia, but he was 30 seconds behind his teammate in third. He was eighth in Japan, when you might remember he lost out to Alonso and Russell. And he was eighth in China when his teammate was second. So it wasn't a good start to the year for him. But... Again, he didn't score any points in Miami, but it was far better performance-wise. And that has, as we went through with some of the statistics on Sunday's episode, that has been something of a springboard for him uh, for the rest of this year. And then the third element, I know it's not McLaren-specific, but it might be Red Bull news, but Adrian Newey leaving at that weekend fills a void. That void can be filled by McLaren. So uh, I think I, I just think, actually, when we come to the end of this season, even if they don't win either championship... In terms of like what could be achieved next year and the year after that, we might just look at this weekend and say there was a lot different after it than what was before. Grade for them, Sam. I give them an A minus. Yeah, don't like that. I've got A minus as well. Oh, copy Harry. cat. Oh no, I've got A minus. I might oh. A minus as well, if I could say. Oh, copy copy. We all love A minus. Um, we'll no, do we one more team. We'll do one more team <laughs> before the break. We'll have a look at Ferrari. Sam? Free Charles Leclerc. Nice. That is a fair shout. I've gone for potential wasted again. Oh, Harry? I've gone for good at Monaco. Oh. <laughs> Matter of fact, I enjoy that. <laughs> um, Sam, tell us why. That's what it says on the thing, right? Free the boy. Um, yeah, I mean, Leclerc sold his soul for that Monaco win because I've, you know, they've never seemed to be remotely potent again after that moment. But they should have sh- shown so many moments of potential. And to then go from being arguably as fast as McLaren was in the first few Grand Prix, and it was on a knife edge. McLaren fell one way, Ferrari fell the other. Where McLaren fell forwards and ended up becoming the ultimate challenger for this season so far, and arguably the the... the favourite, the front runner for the championship at this point. Ferrari very much toppled backwards and you have been now overtaken by Mercedes on pace. Red Bull are still fast in them and McLaren are well off into the sunset. They're lucky that someone like Aston Martin is so far behind that this won't really be a challenge for them. But when you've got drivers as, as high potential as Charles Leclerc sticking around, you owe it to him to provide a car that can regularly be right up there time after time after time. And when you see the demise of Red Bull and you think, oh, who's going to take over from that you know, that falling in form, you think it's got to be Ferrari. They were there in 2023. Um, they were there in 20, to a degree. They were the team that won. They were there in 2022 for half a season as well. You think, oh, they could grasp this. They can now be the ones to move forward. And they're not even the second team closest to them at this point. So the fact that their upgrades have been such a failure, especially with the hiring of uh, big Freddy Vass, you'd like to think that he would have got this underway, but the strategy is still bad. Um, Freddie Vass seems to have not made the technical impact that I expected him to have made this early on. And I am thinking that he should have made his impact by now. I do think we're far enough in that I'm expecting it. And, you know, Sykes has been a little bit absent since being thrown away so early with that decision to sign Hamilton so long in the season. I don't think he's been brilliant for the last few Grand Prix. It's just all going the wrong way. At a time where it could easily be success story for them, it's very much going the wrong way. 
And that's why I've got potential wasted again, because it should be so much better. I, I want to paint a scene here, and it, it refers to Monaco. So, of course, Charles Leclerc won that Grand Prix. Carlos Sainz was also on the podium. So after that race, Red Bull did lead the Constructors' Championship, but they led it only by 24 points ahead of Ferrari. McLaren were then 68 points further back from Ferrari. So it was at that point, at least, a bit of a two-horse race. You tell Freddie Vass, Jungle is Vassive, in the next six races, Red Bull are going to win two of them, and they're only going to have one other podium alongside those two wins. What would he have said? He would have said, great, we must be leading the championship. Because if Red Bull are only going to achieve three podiums in six races, and Ferrari are only 24 points behind, you immediately assume we've probably won two then, or maybe even three. We've probably got more podiums than they have we're probably winning this championship. And not only is that not true, they're not even the closest challengers anymore. They've been usurped by McLaren and they have somehow managed to get their magician's hat out and they've turned a 24-point deficit into a 63-point deficit. This is the one instance where more points is not better. A a deficit, you want less. Um, Honestly, and maybe this is going one step too far, but who knows? I think by the end of this season, we might look at that Imola upgrade of Ferrari and say that cost them the championship. I I really think that they should be at the very least in the mix with McLaren and and Red Bull right now. I think they should be winning the Constructors' Championship if those upgrades work. I just want to applaud you on your use of usurped, by the way. It's a phrase that should be used more and you deliver it brilliantly. Thank you, sir. Uh, underrated word. Do you remember mm. when uh, Carlos Sainz was like, yeah, 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 we've, these upgrades are going to, we're going to win. That's going to be Carlos. Carlos. We're unbeatable now. Uh, excellent. Good at Monaco, <laughs> Harry. Yeah, they were good at Monaco and that is it. Uh, Australia, obviously they, they won as well. Uh, somewhat fortunate, I think that Verstappen retired and McLaren hadn't woken up yet after 2023. They were still asleep back in uh, Woking um, because otherwise I don't think they would have won that race. But Monaco is the clear one you could point to where they were quick, but mainly it's Monaco and Leclerc could back everyone up so there were no gaps. Um, and that's been the story of the season. I also imagine that Charles Leclerc, you know, in the one of the Simpsons, you know, Halloween specials where Homer sells his cell for a, for a donut to devil Ned Flanders. God, I love that episode so much. That's Charles Leclerc. He so, he sold his soul for a Monaco GP win, and the the price did it make is... his head the shape of Monaco? <laughs> yes, <'cause... laughs> he didn't even sell his soul for a world championship. Like you're not even doing that right. No, a home it's, uh, win. For the win, yeah. Come on. Um, but yeah, it's this it's the summary of their season. That's all they've been good at, uh, and. As you said, you'd rather be good at like a whole year of F1 than just Monaco because Monaco's quite the quite the anomaly in uh, in F1. So, yeah, it's not it's not been amazing. And as you say, it probably should have been so much more so far. What would you grade them, Harry? I've given them. Oh gosh, my my phone's locked. I've given them a C. Sam, I've given them an E plus. Oof, that's me. I've uh, I've matched Harry. I've gone with a C. Um, we'll take our first break on this episode, but on the other side, we're looking at Mercedes, we're looking at Aston Martin, and we're looking at Minardi. <laughs> we still refuse to call them. <laughs> oh, yeah. Correct. Okay, welcome back. We've done the first three teams on this grid. We now go to the team sat in fourth place. That's Mercedes. And what is your three-word summary, Sam? Uh, I've gone for just keep swimming, because they are swimming very much in the right direction at a nice consistent pace and they finally understand where they're going. And let me tell you, once you learn to swim, it's much nicer than not knowing how to swim when you're in water. <laughs> That's a great point. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Goodness me. They finally understand and they're finally going the right way. They got their, so, got their 15 meter badge. They did. You know, sewed to their towel. So, so, put it on your towel, mate. They got Frosties. <laughs> yeah, they got the Frosties collection. <laughs> Got you all of them. Yeah, Lined me. up along the bottom of the towel. It's a very um, British reference. That's so, <laughs> so British. Look up Frosty swimming badges if you're not from the UK. Um, they're a great. They're, <laughs> hit the mic and everything. Sorry. God, this podcast is a mess. Summer break vibes. Um, sorry, we're still running my three word phrase. We haven't got some explanation yet. That's all right. Harry, what was your three word summary? Uh, I've gone for crap now good. 
<laughs> You're really literal with these. Thank you. <laughs> uh, mine is another way of saying that, which is back on track. Um, but nice. we, I think we've all gone for a very similar vibe on this one, Sam. Yeah, I mean, like I was saying, it feels like they have so many months and races of we've understood the car and then you really haven't understood the car and we're bringing upgrades and then they release an apology letter and we're back and then it's uh, ninth and 11th in qualifying and finally there's some consistency three of the last four have been wings George Russell okay has had a DNF no fault of his own and they've been disqualified I'm not saying that's his fault but uh, it's a mistake of the team but the fact that Hamilton's got two Russell's got one arguably there could have been more podiums um, available to them they're bringing up grades and going, we don't understand them because of um, the car, but we don't understand them because of setup. We're going to make some additions. Fine. It feels positive. It feels like we're going the right way about things. And let's just hope they don't absolutely muck it up with half a season to go because there's genuinely a chance that they could sweep themselves right up the championship table if things continue to go to plan. Harry? My, uh, my um, Go on. Crap, what buddy. could yours possibly be? Yeah, I was just going to say <laughs> on uh, on on uh, understanding the car. There's still a little bit of them. That even though they won, they've won a few now. They won in Spa. They interviewed Toto after the race, and he still was a bit like, oh, I "Don't, I don't really know how that happened." Did Hold anyone on. know that? No, I'm not like sure. They're just, the they're just a bit like, "Well, that was good." Don't know. That's a what? very good excuse for a Patreon <laughs> plug because this is something that myself and Sam talk about um, regarding Andrew Shovlin's comments about how it looks like they're bringing the floor upgrade back on at Zandvoort <laughs> when they took it off after practice. So I, I think you're right, though. I think I don't think they still are a thousand percent sure. Yeah, not sure. I've got one too. But anyway, um, yeah, crap. Now good. I I was they, I went for this because uh, they were still a bit crap at the start of the year, obviously. Uh, but I was thinking about how uh, George Russell's crash he had in Australia, which whether or not you believe the Alonso brake testing theory, but that's where they were. That's who they were battling. They were with the Aston Martins, and now they're winning races. Which, given Australia wasn't that long ago, it was only March. Um, to have that sort of turnaround in form, I think warrants a crap. Now, good in my view. Yeah, um, the only thing I would disagree with is that it was a bit crap. It was awful to start this year by Merce- by Mercedes. I only have three words, mate, so I can. Ah, uh, that's a very good point. <laughs> <write> the rules. <laughs> Sucker for rules. Um, if you're looking at the hybrid era, 2014, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, and 2022, every single year in that time span, they got a podium at the first race of the season. At least a lot of those were wins as well, but they got at least a podium at the first race of the season. 2023 was the exception. It was a, it was an awful start. They didn't get a podium until their third race. It took them nine attempts this year. They were really bad to start this year. Um, they were routinely, like you say, battling the Aston Martins. There were a few Grand Prix, Australia particularly. They weren't that far ahead of the RB guys. Like It was... It was a tough start to this season, and it's important that we, you know, review the full season rather than just the last couple of Grand Prix, which have been obviously far better. Um, the fact that they didn't have a podium for the first eight races, and they've had a podium at every race for the last six, it does show the transformation that has happened. Um, but yeah, I, I don't think we can ignore where they came from. There's a reason they're fourth in the championship, which if they finish there, that will be their worst championship position since 2012. Like this is still. Even with those wins, the recovery still needs to go much, much further. It was so bad at one point early this season where I think after after the eight races where they, they didn't have a podium, there were five drivers who had more points than both of their drivers combined. Like this was an awful start to the year, but you're right. It is certainly getting better. Grade, Sam? Uh, because of, I think, your very rightful explanation, I feel like they've almost split the first half of this season exactly half and half. I've given them a C. I think they were dire to start with, and I think they've been superb the last kind of five or six races. So right down the middle of the grading, it's a C. Harry? Yeah, I'm exactly the same. I'd, uh, if first half I'd have gone, or first quarter, I'd have gone like a D minus, maybe an E. The second half a B plus. Uh, second quarter B plus. So yeah, a C in total. Yeah, fair logic. I've got C minus, but yeah, we're fairly close on that one. Aston Martin. Sam? Ouch! Mike Crack! <laughs> For God's sake. Ben, you weren't here before this episode started, <laughs> and Sam Sam tested that one before. He was like, I, I want to make a Mike Crack joke. What goes with it? And Kirsty suggested ouch. She so, nailed it. 
I, I, the thing is, I, I'm i sighing here. I can't even complain that much because I, I made a half mic crack joke. Tell the, the joke. Patreon episode. Tell the joke, I, I don't even remember what it was now. Um, mic crack in the hot seat. Oh, yeah, I was asking, is is mic crack on the hot seat? Nice. Um, it's all right, Ben. You've got the Alpine one to go yet, and I know what Sam's going to say. So. Oh, oh, yeah, that's going to be good. <laughs> I highly doubt that. Um, <laughs> Harry, what was your three-word phrase? Uh, I said, try again, 2025. <laughs> um, We're using the I, numerical version of 2025. Numbers, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay. I had to get some alliteration in here at least once, so I've used it on Aston Martin, and I've said, uh, Fernando feeling frustrated. Oh, nice. nice. Love a bit of alliteration. Sam, I'm not going to repeat yours, but um, why do you think it? <laughs> I think, um, as we discussed very much in the Patreon episode, I think we're getting to the point where the responsibility is coming down to the man at the helm of the development of this team in this car, and that is Mike Crack. I do think that he... Look, Harry, I said it with a straight face. Come you on, laughing. It's not Come on. Me. I've done this silly bit. God. Oh, dear. Um, I think that realistically, he's just got to a point where... I, I think he's lost his way. I think he's struggling to keep this team under wraps. I think the development of the team and the car isn't going the way he wants. And Lawrence Stroll is shelling out. He's paying for every hire he can get. They've got the state-of-the-art facilities now. Things are moving in their direction in every way but results on track. And as we said again in Patreon, I think that they haven't had a solid result since kind of May, June time last year where they got a consistent run of really good results. That's like 14, 15 months at this point. It's not good enough. And at what point do you start blaming the guy who's running the show? So I think they're struggling, but I think he might be the guy to blame. Harry, you just think that this season's done? Just move on to 2025. Yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd give give this one a rest and start again next year. Um they could they could try and continue to improve, but the upgrades they have been bringing have been. I mean, they haven't done that much, have they? Um, so it only worked. Yeah, so I I, I call, call it call it a day on twenty twenty four. Um, get a head start. I when I was writing this out, I almost didn't put twenty twenty five. I almost put twenty twenty six, and I was like, maybe just sack off the next year and a half. And go Fernando big. would murder you. Yeah, but I've, if you tell Fernando you're aiming for 20, if you get to 26 and then it's still crap, then he will come and he'll hunt you down. He will, uh, yes. But if you tell him 2026 is going to be good and it does, it, it is good, then he'll be a happy boy. So I didn't write that, but I think the, the general gist is forget this year. Oh, yeah, I decided to focus on Fernando Alonso for, for my three words. Um, is this the worst car he's had since like the start of 2022? Because the Alpine car he was in in 2022, at least the end of that year, wasn't too bad. I think you might have to go back to the beginning of 22 for the last time. Mm. He had a car that was struggling this much. Um, uh, but, you know, at the start of this year, it was, it, right. was, oh, it was okay enough. Like, there were plenty of... Okay- he out-qualified the car on quite a few occasions, I think. And essentially, the race was a question of, can he hang with the drivers that were probably quicker than him, but starting just behind him? And sometimes the answer was yes, sometimes the answer was no, but there were a few occasions like Saudi Arabia, uh, Japan being another one, where he was at least in the fight with some of these Mercedes and McLaren guys. But the last eight races, he's only scored three times. So it's it's just been a bit of a dire run, for, and not for just Alonso, just for the team generally. Um, the problem, I've, I think, with Aston Martin is they've, if you're doing Alonso 101, don't don't give him a competitive car and then take that away from him. Ooh, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's not how you do Fernando Alonso. Like, don't do that. Um, you know, you so, know. Sorry, Ben. Yeah. So you know he's he's frustrated because at the start of races, especially last year, Alonso would would hang back. He'd always hang back mm, and yeah, he was yeah. fighting for those podiums because they could they could look after the tires quite well, and that was kind of their strategy. The start of this year, you started to see the same thing. You'd be like, oh, he's doing the same thing. And then it was like, oh, no, wait. He's just... Bahrain straight away out of the gates, yeah. wasn't it? Like, like, oh, he's doing the same again. And then it was like, oh, no, it's not. It's just, it's just not quick. Yeah. yeah. Um, I did just want to say this as well, because obviously he moved on from Alpine. He spent uh, his last two years at Alpine. He was obviously... He moved away for something far better. He only scored 81 points in the last two, like in both of the last two seasons he had at Alpine. He's currently got 49 this season with 10 races to go. Sounding very similar to what he had at Alpine, isn't it? Like it, it's going to be probably about the same number. Yeah, but it could um, be worse. Could be he could be at Alpine. <laughs> I'm not saying, <laughs> I'm not saying he should have stayed at Alpine, by the way. I'm just saying that him moving away was for an upgrade and actually, at least compared to Alpine of then, 
at the moment, yeah, there's not much difference. A grade for Aston Martin, Sam. I got D plus. Um, I feel really quite let down with where they are at the moment. Ditto D plus. Harry, I went for C minus, but that's probably me being a bit bit kind. One grade in it, not too much at all. Um, the last one of this uh, group of three, RB Minardi, Sam. Let Lawson drive. Oh, okay. We're going into lineup with Sam. Harry? I've said don't do upgrades. Uh, interesting one, because you can read that one in two different ways. Um, I've gone for top five, sure. <laughs> There's too much punctuation oh, yeah. in your two words. <laughs> I forgot at the start of the year. They were like, yeah, 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 we'll be uh, top, top five. Top yeah, five. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so you're all aboard the Liam Lawson hype train, Sam. We've said it so many times. And I'm involved in Red Bull in this as well. But the team has lost its way. The purpose of this junior team was for driver development. It was for experimental parts. And it was to make sure that the, the top team, Red Bull, which is ironic that this team is called RB in its real translation, um, are the ones that should get all of the goodies, right? They're the ones that should be going on to race wings, to championship wings, to podiums at best, at worst rather. And yet, it looks like they're all away at sea at the moment. They've got no idea what they're doing with any of their driver lineups. Max Verstappen, who should be the most secure man in Formula One, could, not, could be going anywhere. Perez has got the worst form going. Daniel Ricciardo's form was terrible for a lot of the season, which it is increasing, but arguably still isn't good enough to get put into Red Bull. Sonoma has been there for longer than any other junior driver going. And Liam Lawson, who looks like a real talent and really impressed me and many others when he stepped in for Ricciardo's seat last season, cannot break into this team, which is for junior drivers. And he's so much younger than the rest of them. So what's the freaking point of having a junior team if you ain't got no junior drivers? I don't. No, yes, that was a reference. I'm not going to go into detail. <laughs> I it really is. thought that was. <laughs> it oh, was. boy. Oh, no. <laughs> um, yeah, I just think the team's in absolute state. The upgrades don't work. They can't get results on track. They're barely beating Aston Martin or Haas unless they get a really lucky day. So the guy who's putting, I think, the best season he's ever had is getting no reward for it. They're just a state. I don't think they know what they're doing with themselves. And we haven't even got onto Alpine yet, but they are in a bit of a mess, I think, old, uh, old RB. Harry, I wasn't sure whether your one of don't do upgrades was um, that they seemingly can't do them because they don't work or whether it was an instruction just not to try anymore to do upgrades. Both. Love that. Yeah. <laughs> they, it was, their start of the year was actually, I mean, certainly in Sonoda's hands, was going relatively well. Um, then they brought up upgrades to Austria and they were terrible and they just haven't really gained much momentum from there. Uh yeah, they, the ones they brought were terrible and it just suggests that they don't know what they're doing with that car. So don't do them. Don't do them. Go back to go back to the old car. Much better. Yep, I think that's fair. Um, it, it, Ricardo has said on a, a number of occasions that there were uh, high speed high speed corner issues with the car that this upgrade was supposed to solve and it just hasn't. So um, I don't think it's the worst idea in the world. I've gone for top five, sure. Um, because if you... Don't remember, this was uh, touted by Daniel Ricciardo as being a possibility to get top five finishes at the beginning of this season. 14 races in, they have a fourth place in a sprint. But apart from that, all they've got is a couple of seventh place finishes. Um, It's just the the team's not kicked on in the same way that a few people pre-season thought they might do. Because they did have some encouraging results at the end of last season, but it just hasn't really ever developed for them. I mean, Sonoda's been... Okay. Ricardo had a bad start, but since then has been okay. The car's been okay. They've they've they have actually scored points in eight of the last nine races. The problem is it's all low points. And I I'm astonished by this fact, by the way. This is even by my I love this stat. Since the start of 2022, and so that covers Alpha Tauri, of course, not just RB. They have scored points on 28 occasions, that team. Not one of them has been a double points finish. They wow. cannot do it. How do you score 28 consecutive, like 28 times since the start of 2022? You have to go back to 2021 for the last time that both drivers score points in a race. Okay, that's me. Yeah. Um, anyway, they're not in a great place. I agree with what you've said, Sam, about the, the junior program. It's not just, I, I feel like you can, with this team, you can either be quick but not a great developing team or a great developing team but not quick but you can't have neither and at the moment I I think they have neither 
the grade for them, Sam? I'm just giving them a D. Um, they're just letting me down. D plus. <laughs> Harry, don't bite. I've, I've gone. <laughs> please, please don't. For the same. Can it, but let's just burn this episode to the ground. <laughs> <laughs> I've gone for I've gone for D as well, unfortunately. Oh, that is a shame. Three D's in the Megardi. <laughs> There's a plus on mine. Um right. We're taking our second break. On the other side, uh we're gonna we're gonna sort out the other four teams on this grid. To a Scott check. <laughs> oh not again. <laughs> Welcome back. We've um, we've got through all the all the good teams on the grid. We've gone through the first six. We're now starting to get into the teams that have struggled to score points so far this year. Um, at least one team that is, I would argue, doing better than they thought they might do is Haas. Sam, three word summary for Haas. Let Kamatsu cook. Oh, he's got that that spicy oven moving around in there, and it's uh, it's tasty. I do need to confirm something. Are you spelling cook with a K? I was spelling it with a K, yes, on both ends of the word. Good. I, I appreciate that. Um, <laughs> Harry? Uh, I've said finally understood tyres. Yeah, that's pretty much mine. I've gone nice. tyre struggles solved. Well done. That's, I think that's the closest thing we've had to a match so far. <laughs> yeah. But um, Sam, you've gone for a cooking analogy instead. Why is Komatsu cooking? Yeah, he's cooking up an absolute storm. They finally found the ingredients and I can make a tasty meal. Um, it's a shame, really, that it's taken them this long to get back to any resemblance of the form they had in the late teens, where they quite regularly were finishing, you know, fourth, fifth, sixth in the Constructors' Championship and fighting hard with some really established constructors. And then from about 2020, it absolutely fell off a cliff for them. But it seems like there's some resemblance to that old form now. And six good Steiner steps away, there seems to be a fresh approach to management. I'm not saying that he was a total failure because... Even now, I imagine there are still some remnants of his design choices and the way he set up the team floating around. You know, So I imagine it's not all just Komatsu starting afresh, but I do think he's really grabbed it by the helm. I do think he's much more technically minded than Gunter Steiger in this sense. I think he's pushing the team in the right direction. They have understood tyres. Hulkenberg is also having one of the seasons of his career and Magnussen's just a little box office menace. And he's having a good old time for all of our entertainment. So, yeah, I'm, I mean, they're a little far down on points, but they ain't nowhere near as far down as we said they were going to be when we predicted our Constructors' Championship. Oof, yeah. Um, we'll be doing that in a couple of months' time, reviewing those wrong predictions. Um, Harry, I assume we're probably going to make very similar points, so I shall let you have the floor first. Um, well, I, I'm going to start mine with uh, a formal apology to the entirety of the Haas team, because in testing, pre-season testing this year, Haas came out and were like, we're not going for lap times. We're spending basically the entire test understanding tyres and I think we and I, I myself definitely were like why are Haas even here this is ridiculous they're a waste of space imposters etc etc and I hold my hand up and I apologise to Komatsu and the rest of the team because it worked it actually worked and they're way better with their tyres and it's it's given them results this year Hulkenberg can have a belt in qualifying and, and stay there now in the race which is rewarding for him and not depressing I imagine there's only been a couple of occasions where he's ended up back down towards Magnussen in latter races but for the most part it's been good so uh, a much much improved Haas team this year and as you say Sam I think yeah kamatsu has been I think he's been a fresh breath of fresh air but could the Steiner probably uh, you know lay, lay the foundations for the, this performance this year so let's give him a bit of credit as well yeah, I have to admit, I wasn't sure whether to make this three-word summary about Hulkenberg, his P6 in Austria, Komatsu, Magnussen's tactics at the beginning of this season, a brand new lineup for next year. Uh, and then I as, as, uh, I basically landed on all of that is irrelevant if they don't solve the tyres. Like, it all starts and ends at what they did in that preseason test. And, and you're right, Harry, I think we all uh, owe them an apology because they were seriously slow in preseason testing. But you know what? They can be as slow as they like in those sessions if it means results on race days like we've had so far this year. It, it's easy to forget. Like last year, Nico Hulkenberg, he made it through to Q2 or Q3 17 times. There was nothing wrong with the pure pace of that car last year. It was very good over one lap. This year so far, uh, it's 11. So halfway through the year, it'll probably end up being about the same number. But 
last year it was meaningless because they just couldn't convert anything. They couldn't convert Hulkenberg getting into Q3. This year, they have been able to do that. So I, I commend the team. The only thing I will say at the end of this point is last couple of races have been a bit tough and I hope it's not the start of a decline. So, so far this season, they've only had three races where they haven't had a driver inside the top 12. They had a double DNF at Monaco. The other two have been the last two races. So as long as this isn't the start of them falling back down the grid. Um, other than that, though, it's it's a very small negative on what has been a largely positive season so far. Grade for them, Sam. Uh, I've given Haas a B plus. I've gone even better. I've gone A minus. Harry. I've gone for a B. Love that. Good work, Haas. Oh, Alpine. Well, you better hit me with it, Sam. What is it? You fat b- <laughs> You fat b- <laughs> You fat b- <laughs> uh, Sam sought express permission from producer Kirsty because that needs to be bleeped. Yeah, that's three bleeps. Apologies. <laughs> I've used up my allotment for the year. I've got to admit, I was, um, I was torn between two. I almost went with good luck, Ollie. Um, in the end though I went with uh, along the same lines but perhaps a slightly better way of saying it uh, overweight and understaffed nice that's at least five words that's definitely three <laughs> words <laughs> Harry um, I've just gone for oh no no oh no nice. <laughs> can't put the extra no in there at the end no <laughs> the mini gotta play by the rules son <laughs> oh no <laughs> oh no <laughs> Um, right, Sam. Um, <laughs> you fat b. Oh, oh he's one. got a bleep in there. Curse is furious. Curse is furious. You take ask for permission. Oh, um, I don't. I don't get. Okay, yeah. <laughs> after after the earlier round, takes some Ben Hawking he doesn't need permission anymore. That's fair. He's swinging. <laughs> um, right, yeah. I mean, the the car's too fat, but the team's too lean. I mean, Ooh, what more can I say? You can't actually make a car that's able to actually go at a normal weight level, and every other. T- Mercedes were underweight. Do you remember a couple of years ago, Alfa and Mayo were the only ones under the weight limit and they had to bring it up to make sure... I still feel fun. bad for them Ridiculous. about that. Ridiculous. <laughs> oh, we actually complied with the rules, so we're punished. Well, Alpine are dreaming or something like that. I guess the car's overweight because they've got no one in the team to actually take anything off of the car anymore. They've probably just got Top Gear Dog trying to look for a spanger to take something off of it. That's how useless they are as a team at the moment. The the team still doesn't like each other between the French and English departments. They've lost another team principal. They're losing team members left, right, and centre. It's so long, it looks like the bloody Magna Carta has been signed by every county in the country. Honestly, it's an absolute state. And it, it could not be the biggest mess. And remember, they're trying to make a Hollywood journey out of it, just like they've done with Wrexham in, for, in, F, in football, for God's sake. It's not looking good. It's looking more like a bloody DC Joker movie. It's not even part of DC, is he? He's part of Marvel. No, he is. Batman's DC. Yes, nerds. That's as much as I know. My point here is Alpine are an absolute state and they're going to sort it out. Okay. Um, overweight and understaffed. Uh, last four seasons, 155 points, 173 points, 120 points, 11. It's not good. Uh, it's mm. And to be clear... We weren't being very complimentary about Alpine in those three years because we thought they were still underperforming. But goodness me, if they had the opportunity to go back to that, they would take it straight away. I I don't have all that much to add on top of what Sam's already said. It kind of writes itself, this one. Um, They've had nothing better than ninth all season long. Matt Harmon and Dirk De Beer took one look at that car at the beginning of the year and went, nope, (laughs) we're off. Um, And they haven't really replaced with, with I forgot anyone, that. Like, I forgot that they left at the start of the year. Yeah, yeah. No yeah. one working there still. Yeah, they just went. Nope. Um, they got rid of Ocon, which was obviously a, a great idea because <laughs> I'm pretty sure if he spent another year at this hellhole of a team, it'd have gone mad. So that's probably a good thing in the long run. Um, yeah, it's just a horribly overweight car that they actually somewhat solved, and it didn't get that much better. I mean, a little bit better, but again, they have 11 points at this at this stage. So. Um, not good. Harry? I mean, not too much more to add than what you've already said. Um, we spoke about Red Bull earlier, and the positives on track, I think, for me, still outweigh the turmoil that's happening behind the scenes. Alpine have got nothing. 
they've got the turmoil and they're really, really slow and unreliable. So it's it's terrible. Hence the, oh, no, no. I'd have more no's if I could because it's that bad. If it was an appropriate number of O's, that would be the podcast. We wouldn't have time to say anything else. Um, what the grade are you giving them then? Uh, I'm giving them a uh, E plus. No, don't deserve a grade. You, you, ungrade it, Sam. I've gone for an F. Good, it's me. <laughs> Not good. Um, they are still somehow beating two other teams on this grid, though. Um, and the first of which is Williams. They currently have four points this season for a couple of ninth place finishes. Sam. I have gone with two steps back. Ooh. Um, I've gone for future over present. Harry? Very similar, but uh, less eloquent. 2026, be good. <laughs> yeah. I'm I'm good. Be good. <laughs> <laughs> Mongo. <laughs> I'm glad Mongo's made an appearance. <laughs> go, Mongo, go. <laughs> oh, dear. Uh, Sam, you've um, two steps back. Yeah, one step forward, two steps back. James Vowles is giving it all the big and and he is selling absolute dreams down Park Market, as we've already spoken about previously. Someone Um, commented on our Instagram, by the way, about Park Market, which I respected. There's a listener out there who's been... That uh, Photoshop of James Vowles at the barbecue or whatever it was as well looks sensational. Go check it out on Instagram if you haven't seen it. It's really good. Um, Yeah, I just, you know, he's talked about this progression, this slow, steady progression. We're getting a team in order. They've got two drivers now that I think his words were something on the lines of you'd be terrified to go up against or to stand next to or something like that, which is, I get it. Album and science for that level of team is a very, very good lineup and fair play to what James Vowles is doing on the contract side. But currently, there is still no real reward when it comes to the actual track performance. And, you know, it's been a while now. We're 18 to 20 months into his proper term, proper delivery. It's not materialising to anything good. They're going backwards. With teams like Alpine struggling even more, with teams like um, Mangardi, who don't seem to know what they're doing with their drivers, with Aston Martin progressively not getting any better, I really thought that this would have been a chance to start to capitalise and have that unity and have that brilliant team that they're pulling up to actually drive the team forward. But they still can't seem to get the car in a decent place. It's it's quite confusing. I'm hoping that it will get better, as you guys said. Uh, Future not present or past, but um, yeah, it's not going well for them at the moment. Mongo? (laughs) (laughs) I'm not sure we can start using that as a game. (laughs) Um, Yeah, I think very similar lines to what you guys are saying. It's um, 2026 has to be, um, and similar to what I was saying about uh, Aston Martin and and Alonso, I guess, earlier on, but but there's been a full admission from Williams that that's what they're focusing on for 2026. They've gone for that, that gamble, and they're they're lining up, you know, lining everything up for that. Drivers, as mentioned, signs in Albon, uh, and then and then obviously everything uh, behind that in terms of facilities and and the resource to give them a good car. So it needs to be good because as of now, it's it's not great. And the, those dreams that uh, the James Vals is selling, they can't be empty because he's been selling them hard quite clearly. And and they, it needs to work when he gets to twenty twenty six. So. Uh, I think you said this, Ben, on on we were talking about signs signing for Williams. That uh, of, all, of all the teams that need a good twenty twenty six, it's Williams. So it needs to be good. Yeah, not too much to add. Um, yeah, signs and album is a ridiculous combination for what will probably be a back market team. Wait, uh, back market might be unfair. I don't think there are any back market teams in F one at the moment, but they um, uh, we've got one more team to go. Yeah, hang on, I've got one more team yet, mate. I mean. Okay, yeah. <laughs> There's one back market team in F1, but it's not Williams. Um, yeah, th- uh, like you say, Harry, them selling dreams all year long because there's not really anything on track that they can point to. Um, I think that this season was kind of lost in the winter. I think this season was lost before it even got started. That winter period was very difficult for this team, and I don't think they've ever recovered. But also, I'm not quite sure they tried all that... I- I don't know what the right way to phrase it is, but I'm not sure they went all out to recover it, knowing that that probably won't actually help them in the long run anyway. Obviously, at the beginning of this year, we had instances like Logan Sargent not being able to start a Grand Prix. Um, I think they could have done more potentially to salvage this year's car, but equally, what's the point when the focus is on next year and more importantly, 2026? So 
their focus will shift to 2025 from now. I would not expect them to score too many more points this season. It wouldn't shock me if they don't score any more at all. But um, yeah, grade for them, Sam. I've given Williams a D. Same. Harry? Uh, yeah, a D. All agreed, um, which leads us nicely on to our final team, Sauber. Sam? Waste of breath. Oof. Goodness me. Also can't disagree. Harry? Terrible green toaster. Can't disagree. Um, I've gone with bottoms at bottom. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Goodness me. Another bottom reference. Yeah, well, I've decided that, you know, if I had one point for every time Valtteri Bottas got his bottom out on Instagram, I'd have more points than Sauber have got. Um, Sam's got it, a picture of Valtteri Bottas's bottom on his wall. That's my calendar. Good. It's his birthday this month. Happy, Happy birthday, birthday, Valtteri. <laughs> um, <laughs> his bum out, I'm sure. I, yeah, well, they're not getting any points out, are they? So might as well get something out. They have zero points for a reason. They haven't got close on most occasions so far this year. Um, They had an 11th place finish to start the year in Bahrain. They haven't had a top 12 finish since then. Um, They haven't had, they've had nothing better than 15th in the last four Grand Prix. It has been a dire run for this team. Um, And even when they have had one or two minor opportunities to get points, they've just shot themselves in the foot because you think China, they had something of an opportunity there. Bottas DNFs because of a, an engine issue or something similar. Um, Japan might have been able to get a point there. They had an awful pit stop because that was the time when they couldn't do pit stops. Um, and then they did figure out how to do pit stops. So they decided to do an unnecessary one at Belgium last time out when they could have <laughs> maybe been somewhere near the points. Decided just because they know how to do them, they brought him into the pits to finish like 15th place. So... This is a bad team that I hope will not be bad in two years' time. Harry? Uh, yeah, they've just, they're just been terrible on all fronts. Um, it, there's there's absolutely no relation to this because Alfa Romeo was just a name. But Alfa Romeo, I'm not saying they were great in the last two years, but Alfa Romeo left and it's got so much worse. <laughs> it's like it's got terrible in line with them being kick or stake or whatever we're calling them. Do, what are they called? I don't remember anymore. <laughs> Everyone's just given up. They have, right? Other than Sauber. Yeah, they just call them Sauber. No one calls them kick or steak because we can't keep up with what they actually are depending what race we're at. Anyway. It's a branding nightmare. Yeah. It's quite funny though. Like No one makes an attempt. It's just Sauber. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, they've been, as you, as you mentioned, they were terrible at pit stops, which kind of covered up the fact that they were slow. So even if they were having a good race, they had a terrible pit stop and then they learned how to do pit stops and then they got trigger happy and, and pit Bottas for no reason in Belgium. So yeah, a terrible, terrible year so far. Final grade of the evening from me, Harry. Uh, an F. Yep. Same. Sam. Yep. Make it a trio. Love that. F's in the chat for Selber. Um, <laughs> we will take our final break on this episode. On the other side, we're playing late faking. Welcome back everyone to the final part of today's episode. It's time for late faking. This is the late faking game Where one answer is fake And the other ones are right So help me Christ I'll make my decision In a second Sam You're gonna have to wait Cause Ben made this game so hard And I'm down by five Beautiful stuff Late faking So there are six questions in front of me Sam and Harry will take it in turns To give me a number I'll give them the question um, Four answers um, One of them is a fake though. They don't belong in the category that I say. It's their job to pick out which one is the fake. So, Harry, what number would you like to start with? Number four, please. Number four. Okay, I'm going to give you four drivers. Only one of them. Why is he laughing? One though. Oh, no. Why is he laughing already? Crikey. Three of these um, never raced in F1. You have to pick out the one that did. Here are your four options. Spider Web. Oh, for goodness sake. Rocky Rhodes. <laughs> Tim Burr. Not my uncle. And Stan Still. Okay, only one of those is racing F1. Unbelievably. Amazing. Three of them are fake. 
spider web. <laughs> I'm going to go for timber. It is not timber. Oh, no. I like on Rocky Roads. Rocky Roads? It's not Rocky Roads. You do a disservice to Mr. Spider Web. <laughs> it's a Surely sticky character. Not. Goodness me. Uh, one of the classic. I think he raced in the Indy 500 in the 50s. Um, but classic. Um, nil, nil. Sam, over to you. Uh, two, please, Ben. Number two. Four drivers. Three of them finished on the podium in their final F1 race. One of them didn't. Okay. Nico Rosberg. Mark Webber, Alain Prost, mm. Nigel Mansell. I'm going to say... Nigel Mansell, oh, thank you. Full title. Uh, I'm going to go Prost. It's not Prost. It's it is not Prost. Dr. Nige. Oh, he was too busy down the ER. Do- Dr. Nige would be a correct answer if he then decided Did he go to McLaren? Not- <laughs> yeah. If he decided not to come back and do a few races for McLaren. Um so we stay at nil-nil. We go back to Harry. Number uh, one. Yeah, you can have one. Um, four drivers. Three of them won a championship, a driver's championship, for two different teams. One of them didn't. Okay. Nicky Lauda. Nicky Lauda. Nicky Lauda. He's back again. Alan Prost. Oh. Jim Clark. And Jack Brabham. What was the question again? <laughs> God. Um, <laughs> Three of those drivers won a driver's championship with two teams, or at least two teams. Thank you. I wasn't paying attention. Alan Prost. Uh, who's the third one? Uh, Clark was the third one. Uh, is it Jim Clark? It is Jim Clark, yes. Um, Nicky Lauda won a championship with Ferrari, uh, and then later in the 80s with McLaren. Prost for McLaren and for Williams. Brabham for Cooper, and then his own team. Uh, Jim Clark did win two championships, but won them both with Lotus. So boss, isn't it, winning with your own team like that in Formula 1? That is so cool. Big boss Pretty move. damn cool. 1 0. Back to you, Sam. Uh, I'm number five, please, Ben. Number five. Uh, four drivers. Three of them have competed in the hybrid era. One of them hasn't. Oh, God, it's one of the most vague names, isn't it? Narrator. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Andre Lotterer. Great. Charles Peake. Max Chilton. And Will Stevens. Oh, God, he's going to be furious at me if I get drunk. <laughs> I knew he was going to get a grumpy reference. In <laughs> um, I'm going to go Lotterer. It's not Lotterer, it's Shell Peak. Oh, that piqued my interest. That's a harsh one. Lotterer only did one race, he barely did a race. Yeah. He was a stand in for one Grand Prix, oh, Andre. Then was so, terrorised Formula E. <laughs> Justice for Peak. <laughs> Still 1 0, Harry. Back to you. Oh, man. Number three. Yes! <laughs> we have it. Did you have to say three because you didn't know? Yes, the literally. One. I can't remember what else I was. <laughs> Uh, right number three Uh, i'm gonna give you four drivers and seasons Uh, i'd like to tell you you to tell me in which of these seasons the champion did not get to 400 points okay so you've got max verstappen in 2021 right max verstappen in 2022 lewis hamilton in 2018 and lewis hamilton in 2019 they won, but they didn't get to 400 points. In one of those years, that driver's champion did not get to 400 points. In the other three, they got at least 400. I'll go with Verstappen in 21. It is Verstappen in 21, yes. A close run thing, um, which I know, but I didn't write down, but it was close. Um, <laughs> okay. That does mean uh, Harry will take the win on this one. He's currently 2-0 up. Sam, there is one question left, though. Number six, please, Ben. You can have number six. Uh, Four drivers, three of them have at least 25 pole positions in F1. One of them does not. Lewis Hamilton, Michael Schumacher, Max Verstappen. Lewis Hamilton, Michael Schumacher, Max Verstappen. No, no, and no. (laughs) Charles Leclerc. Nico Rosberg. He's back again. Alain Prost. Can't keep away from this game. Uh, And Fernando Alonso. Oh, bugger. Um, 
don't know, Rosberg. It's not Rosberg. Do you know what phrase I hate on this podcast? It's not. Snot. Snot. Because he never says it's not. It's not. <laughs> and I'm sick of hearing it before I get things wrong. Get okay, something right then, mate. You know, stop saying it. <laughs> you know Give me another answer and I might, I might change No, I'm not going down this. No. What was the question? <laughs> the question was, uh, four drivers, three of them have got at least 25 pole positions. Oh. And it's not Rosberg. I can't remember the other answers. Don't worry. Put, put oh, sure. Um Of those four, Alain Prost has the most with 33. Then comes Rosberg with 30. Charles Leclerc has exactly 25 pole positions, which is just tragic how that man has 25 <laughs> pole positions and just nothing to show for it. Like six um, wins. <laughs> he has more pole positions than Fernando Alonso, who was the correct answer. He has 22. Goodness me. Two-time world champ. Yeah, two-time world champ with 22. Two twos. Two. <laughs> two. Well, there's time for one more segment, of course. You know what's coming up. It is the one and only, what I would probably call the greatest segment in all of podcasting. <laughs> it is the LB question of the week. We- Beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> the question of the week this time was, um, what are we up to on our summer holidays? Of course, it is the summer break. Uh, we do sometimes have lives outside of this podcast, and I stress that sometimes in that sentence. Um, but what do you think we're up to? Any answers that caught your eye? I might actually leave because the comment section is just roasting me. It is brutal. <laughs> it is a Harry Hellfire out here. <laughs> Oh gosh! Um, I'll go for one that isn't but roasting me, which is from Mura on Instagram, saying learning how to bake pumpernickel. Just that's nice. Yeah, it's a nice. I do a course, life. little group activity. Yeah. Um, Master of the Sun says Soski's out, most likely. Um, Wonger and Carl says try to recruit Barry Mangalow to fill in for Harry. Uh, obviously, if we could get Barry for Harry, I'm here for it because then we could do the podcast in the Copacabana and we're having a great time. Hashtag Barry for Harry is a, is a campaign <laughs> we're going to start. <laughs> Vote Barry for Harry. I'm sure he'll lead the campaign. Um, great primordial soup, great name. So this is a trick question. Harry's perplexed on summer break. And uh, the next one, again, someone's just said Shrek party. <laughs> I didn't see that one. I'm so Shrek here for party. Shrek party. I think that came in late, yeah. Um, Alistair1992, this one really made me laugh today because it's simple. It just says podcasting, <laughs> which is fair. Like, yeah, we're we will, yeah, we will be. Uh, there were a few I liked. So um, this one was from Ethan, and this might have been uh, a repeated reference, but we, we do have a few that have just said Jonathan Wheatley <laughs> <laughs> in reference to the last episode. Um, Steve, this one properly got me. Gorge on gammon and jacketed potatoes. <laughs> <laughs> jacketed. Excellent. I love that. Um, Tyler S. 33. I can't read your first answer, but the second answer and gammon. Oh, I'll I let... know what the first answer is. Yeah. I'll yeah. tell you what, 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 what a combination. Um, I'm sure. I'll let yeah. people go and look at that on their own time. It's on Instagram. But goodness me. Uh, the Dark Knight also says visiting all of nine, uh, Altmar's nine children. Because, yeah, obviously. A lot of Altmar references, of, of course, Altmar. as always. Um, there's one here from Brand that I really like. Ben will do a photo shoot with his older brother, Big Ben. <laughs> 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 such a bad joke but also right. it's very it's excellent um, Martin Tom says take on Mission Impossible and make friends with Gene Haas which is I, oh, it can't be done it's only a couple of weeks this summer break come on oh yeah I need like 10 years to crack that safe um, last one from me from Benjamin Rose Wordy Bar Factory Tour yeah I would also like to really go to the Wordy Bar Factory so if anyone can arrange that if you work for Asda please hit me up <laughs> <laughs> Um, Any last ones? Matthew Bonner, you could, that's just disgusting, but compose a list ranking all 20 drivers in order of who has the girthiest sausage. Yes! Said that. And finally, Chris May, Sam will throw a ring into a volcano. <laughs> it's a great reference. 
Sure. It's another wild and wonderful question of the week. Um, and of course, we will be back with another one this time next week. Um, Sam, if you wouldn't mind, until the next episode, getting us out of here. This has been a summer break episode. It's been absolutely chaos. So don't forget, if you want to see this live and in person, and you happen to be in Austin, Texas, yeehaw, for Cota, um, you can, tickets are available. The link is in the description. Remember that Patreon people get it first. And you can sign up to Patreon and get tickets early. So that option is there for you. Please come and support us. It means the world to us. We'd love to see you, have a drink with you. And remember, you can park your car there for free. So don't miss out on that mega opportunity. Shut up. For free? <laughs> Free pocket. Man who doesn't understand value of money will still pay 10 grand, but the rest of you can have it for free. Oh, for goodness oh, sake. Gosh. Um, follow us on socials, late breaking F1 everywhere. Watch this on YouTube for it has been video recorded. Twitch is available as well, late breaking podcast. And of course, you can join the Discord to chat with us whenever. Ben, is that on the breezes outside? I hear LB quiz. There's another LB quiz coming up. That's right. Um, the. Saturday of Zanvor, whatever date that is, um, that I've immediately forgotten. 24th. 24th? That sounds right, yes. Um, unbelievable. I, it doesn't sound real because that would mean two in one year, two in three months. Um, right. Yes, I'll be doing another quiz, uh, 9 p.m. British time. There you go, folks. So, so much going on. We ain't resting of summer break. Um, and we will see you, of course. Uh, what day is it today? It's going to be Wednesday when you're listening to this. So we'll Correct. see you on Sunday. <laughs> Have a good one. In the meantime, I've been Samuel Sage. I've been Ben Hocking. And I've been a burger up the wazoo. I'm and remember, <laughs> keep breaking late. I wasn't even in the show. <laughs>